Matt. Yes, you're welcome. I just wanted to uh, quickly introduce you. I, I, yes, so he's, a, he's a great guy, of, obviously. Uh, he's working at CRISP. Um, it's, um, it's all about, um, uh, yes, it focuses on products and product grow uh, and is, uh, uh, will help us uh, to uh, help your company to focus on, on product-led growth and how to optimize customer journey. So, so please go ahead, uh, Yossi. Right. Thank you, Christophe. So uh, I hope you guys are all right, that you're not completely worn out after today. It's been some great subjects, but you know sometimes you get fatigued sitting in front of the computer. It's super nice uh, you know, seeing you all here. I think it was quite amazing seeing how many people that uh, showed up from different countries. So today I'm gonna talk about product-led growth. So I think you know what Christophe was talking about, empowered teams, that's something that we all work quite a lot with. Uh, so what Marcus was talking about is an important component of that. But I'm gonna talk about product-led growth is also a component of product teams or empowered product teams or the Spotify model or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it seems like some people are still dropping in. I think that's okay. Uh, should we wait another minute or should we uh, kick it off? You only have a half an hour, so just take it away. <laughs> all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix it up. I think uh, we've all had different techniques when presenting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to contextualize it, have uh, a bunch of cases as well to give you some, you know, to make it relatable. Some out there cases and some much more like companies that I've worked with. Any questions before we start? Cool. So let me just see, there you are. First off, I want to apologize. It's going to be a lot of acronyms. It's going to be a lot of BS. And, uh, and, I, and I say this with love, but our industry is quite, uh, quite packed with, uh, you know, uh, acronyms and uh, life-saving frameworks that's going to solve all your problems. If you just start using OKRs, if you just start using SAFE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just want to apologize for that. Um, I think most important about this is try to use common sense. Cool. This is me. I like to do sports. Uh, I have a beautiful little girl that I love spending time with. And once upon a time, I used to wear a suit and I hated it. I, was, I think that was maybe 13 years ago, something like that. Uh, I just, that's why I started with development and product development, because I could just be myself and, you know, not be so constrained. Um, and I work with product and growth. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, you work very closely with the team, but also trying to shape the product. Now, I've worked for quite a lot of uh, growth companies, but also large corporations. Um, I was at Hemnets for two years up until their IPO. I was at Profoto as head of mobile, you know, working with... Um, uh, prepping their, them for their IPO. Uh, I was at QuickBit, a crypto company, and I've been in a lot of different industries. It's And, and you know, that's one of the best things working with uh, Crisp, that we get to try so many different industries, such amazing companies and so different cases, everything from like, let's do some discovery, let's work with growth, let's, but it's all within product development, right? So, so, and like I said, interrupt as much as possible. I would prefer that I don't go through all my slides, but that we get stuck and have a dialogue instead. So product-led growth or PLG as its abbreviation is, uh, that's the buzzword for today. Like I said, it's gonna be a lot of buzzwords and most of all, it's gonna be like, this is gonna save your company. This is gonna save you. But in reality, it doesn't work like that, right? It's just a tool. Uh, same thing, whatever framework you might be using. So I'll give you some context to it, why product-led growth is so important. 
let's discuss what, how life was pre-inflation just a year ago or two years ago. Well, it was all unicorns and money and startups. And I mean, like I remember back in the day being an entrepreneur was super not sexy. You were just poor. And I mean, at the height of the inflation, you had Ankler, which I don't know if you guys know it, but it's it's a it's a hub where you didn't have to have an idea; you could just be a an entrepreneur, and that hub would give you an idea. You could run with it. I mean, if, if it, people were so obsessed with being an entrepreneur, there was so much money that you don't need to have an idea of your own, and that's kind of wild you know and we're going to talk about how wild and weird that is so if we look at the time frame of it at the beginning like 10 15 years ago you would have like a few of these successful startups because they were breaking new ground it was like they were changing things and I mean, after a while, I mean, it was just crowded, the unicorn club of these billion dollar companies. And we, you know, this is nothing new. We all know it. So what, what was the result of all of this? Well, people throwing around money. You could come up with the silliest idea and you would still get funding. You could have an app with almost zero transactions, but it would be valued to a billion kroners. I actually met a guy that I had like two or three years ago, we had some dialogue at Klarna and he did his own thing. He started up a company. They had zero revenue, but it was already valued at a billion. <laughs> I mean, that's a humongous amount of money. Is it just me? I would love to have a billion, but it, it, it's just pretend, right? On paper, he was a billionaire. And I was like, okay. A friend of mine who had a startup within six months, I think he left his other startup because uh, because of fighting with the other fi founder. He started a new company, which was they weren't going to work with design. They were just going to be like the in between. Within six months, they were valued to three hundred million kroners. Uh, he still, I mean, he still had problems finding an apartment and like paying rent and stuff like that. But he had a three hundred million kroner company, so everyone, like especially VCs, who's just throwing money at you. So how does this relate to product led growth? Well, when you know when you have this, people just want to pour in money into something because they're like going nuts. You're gonna end up with this. People paying six hundred thousand dollars for a, a drawing of a monkey, just like completely out there, right? And we end up with a situation where the emperor is naked. I mean, we all see that this monkey isn't worth six hundred thousand dollars, but we just pretend and we hype it up, just like the emperor is naked, and everyone's like, "Yeah, it looks awesome. It looks great." Because, you know, they're just interested in their own careers or, you know, pumping up the valuation of their own company. And I've worked with that. I've actually worked with startups where they didn't care if the users were converted or anything. They just wanted to buy users to pump up the numbers so they could pump up the valuation and get to the next step, basically. So, okay, let's continue with product-led growth. I'll give you an example of how wild this is. I know I know you all have examples. We all read the news, right? But there was a company called Quibi. I don't know if you've heard of it. So at the height of COVID, you had the most successful um, Hollywood producer of all time, Jeffrey Epstein, and you had the former CEO of eBay that built it from the ground up. They raised $1.8 billion and they had all of the like, you know, famous people in Hollywood to join them. And they created an app. They thought they could compete with Netflix, but the concept was it was only 10 minute videos. So, and they launched, had a big launch at April 6th. You know, this was 
at you know the, like beginning of covid when everyone was stuck at home they just wanted to subscribe to netflix to any type of service so all the soft services were doing great six months later they went bust that's like two billion dollars in six months it's just completely wild right that you could have this i think you get the idea behind it i think you get what i'm trying to say so how is it today well, people started screaming, the emperor is naked. I mean, there's no one who wants to buy a, a picture of a, a drawing of a monkey for $600,000 anymore. So people are saying, oh shit, and running away with the money, just dumping stocks. You see a lot of, at the same time, you have a lot of startups being sold very, very cheap. Uh, because people are saying, if I have the money, I should buy this company because I can get it cheap. But 90% of them, they're, they're just stuck. Can't do anything. They can't find funding. It's a tough time, right? So that was the segue into product-led growth, why it's so important. And I mean, of course, uh, when there was plenty of money and everyone wanted to grow fast, Product-led growth wasn't as important because it was more important gaining grounds and growing fast than growing slowly because otherwise someone would take your uh, marketplace very quickly. Now, I would compare product-led growth with selling avocados. Maybe a stupid comparison, but it's in my book quite accurate. What it's all about is if you go buy avocados, on the outset, they look nice. You open them up, they're great. Awesome. What's going to happen? You're going to go back to that fruit stand or that store and buy more avocados, right? Because your expectations were met. Now, if they were to be rotten inside, you would be quite pissed off. And you would be wary to go back to the same grocer to buy avocados because you're like, he's just cheating me. Now, the same thing is with product-led growth. If you provide value to your customers, they're going to come back and you're gonna, they're going to buy from you. This is how business has been run for thousands of years before we were dumping money. If you do good, people are going to come back. So that's basically what we're talking about. Now, how would you apply that in tech? Because it's a little bit more difficult than just selling avocados, right? Any questions so far, by the way? Cool. Now, first of all, you need to have a pretty good idea what you want to achieve. I mean, you should have a very like, that's where we're heading. I'll give you an example why it can be quite difficult and dangerous not to have a clear goal. So an example of that, Airbnb have nights book, uh, booked, Uber has rides booked, uh, Quora has number of uh, questions answered. So you need to have like as a company or as a product, what are you trying to, what problem are you solving? What service are you providing? If you're selling avocados, you're constantly trying to sell the best avocados. When are they ripe? From which country? From which uh, farmer, et cetera, et cetera. This is the same thing, but applied uh, to tech. Now, if you have multiple teams, the practical thing that you need to start doing is, I need to align my teams. I need to say, if this is our goal, how can I break it down so we all contribute to that goal? So everyone understands. So if Marcus, who's just here, if he has another team, I need to make sure that we don't have the same metrics, but we're working towards the same goal. His team are driving one component, I'm driving another component, and we're going towards the same goal the entire time. If I look at Spotify, for example, there is time spent listening to music. Now, as a team, I'm not going to focus on that because it's too big. But I contribute to it because let's say I'm all the way down here, discover new songs. So my team mission, the KPIs that we have is I want to make sure that you as a listener keep discovering new songs because that leads to increased time spent per session, which will drive up the overall listening, right? And... This is just a simple example, but you need to do the same thing in your companies to be like, okay, how do we go 
the same direction, all of us, and work together. I'll give you a case what happens when you don't do it. So if you don't have the same goal, what happens? You're going to have chaos. Now, I had a company where it was very successful, but it was just chaotic. And the first thing I asked people when I did my assessment was, do you know the strategy and goal? And I said, we know the slogan, but we don't know the goals. So I say, okay, how does this affect collaboration, which is a key thing in tech? Well, product said, our goal is to sell. Don't know what or how. Tech said, deliver according to requirements on time. Results, product tells tech what to do, tells them features. Tech doesn't understand it, so they say, we want detailed requirements. Product needs to hire business analysts to detail them even more, even though they don't know what, they just detail the systems. And we end up with is someone telling the developers how they should do their job and you have no long-term ownership of the product. How does this affect actual development in your IT stack? Well, you'll constantly be adding technical depth and business will constantly be pushing IT to uh, some desired deadline. I think you can all relate to that, right? We've all experienced it, all of us. Now, the first thing you need to do then is we've said you need to set up goals. Okay, we get that. So how do you proceed? What happens when we say, yeah, okay, I'm part of the Discover, Discover New Music team? Well, you need to establish a funnel. Does everyone know what a funnel is? So it's basically, we're keeping it very simple, but it's, it's just a customer journey. Try to say like, what happens at the beginning, what happens later on, right? So you wanna start off with growth. Uh, well, you don't need to start off with growth, but you just need to be just common sense to think like, okay, if I have a new user, what's that journey? Where does that, where do the users churn? Where do they drop off? Where do we have a drop in engagement, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in most companies, the biggest issue is actually here because you'll have someone working with growth or marketing. You have another team, maybe the payment team working with the actual conversion. And then here, once you enter the product, if you have no collaboration, what usually happens is user never opens the app. I think if we look at our phone, majority of our apps, we don't open, right? That That's the most, most common situation. We download an app when we think like, oh, I, I think I need a notif like some app to do something for me, but then we never use it. So you have great marketing telling you like, oh, do, do you want a notes app? Yeah, download this, blah, blah, blah. But then the product team isn't actually working on keeping you there and keeping you engaged or even getting you to open the app. So you're spending millions or you have your colleagues working really hard for this, but no one's bringing you in, taking care of you. It's like being uh, you know, the bouncer at a club. You're yelling at everyone like, come in, it's great mute, it's gonna be awesome. You come in and the bar's closed and you're like, what am I doing here? I'm gonna leave right away or it's empty. Now, Johnny Depp, what does he have to do with this? Well, there's a funny acronym, speaking of the blah, blah, blahs, called Pirate Metrics. Now, if you're going to work with growth or actually if you're going to work with product, and like I said, if you can't rely just on VC money anymore, you kind of need to start measuring your users, how they behave. You, you, you know, if I sell avocados, I need to start asking you, hey, how was the avocado? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it too ripe? Did you like it? Now, the pirate metrics is just an acronym, but it's acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, referral. You could even add awareness at the top of this if you want to. But there are KPIs that you actually measure. Now, you want to see how did this user behave throughout the entire funnel and I'll measure. Now referral is the best one and it's the cheapest way of growing. It's basically you telling me, hey, I like those avocados. You should go and buy some avocados at that guy as well. That's a referral. It's the cheapest and best way of growing. Now back to this, if you were to actually be serious about it, 
And if you want to do it more advanced, you'll start, you know, grouping your users into cohorts. So if you guys don't know, a cohort is a word that comes from ancient Rome, actually, how they would divide their military um, sections. So you had a legion all the way down to cohort. And the reason why we call it a cohort, because if we have a number of people which are statistically significant, I see how they behave throughout the customer journey. And I can say, oh, this is where they started to drop off. I'm going to do some changes. Maybe I'll send out a notification or like I'll add a link. Once, once they've downloaded the app, maybe I'll send out or maybe I'll do a single sign-on. That's like one of the things people are like, oh, they, they, they can never bother registering their uh, login details. So I'll just send like a magic link or single sign-on and I can check in the cohort. How did they behave? Did more people get started? Now, there's a bunch of things you want to measure. You want to measure churn, LTV. LTV stands for lifetime value, CAC, cost of acquisition. You want to measure their behavior, et cetera, et cetera. You can make it quite advanced. But the key thing, again, if we take the avocado experience is, did they taste good? Did you eat them when you got home? You know, stuff like that. Now, yes, is there a question from the chat? Interesting. Yeah. Do, you, do you think the R metric is a good fit for B two B also? Yeah, I mean, again, I I'm very skeptical to all the all the frameworks, all the acronyms. I think it's very important to apply it to your business because depending on where you are, what you do, everything's going to be unique. So, if we go back to this. Take what works for you. If measuring acquisition and activation isn't as important or retention, for example, maybe activation is super important. So in B2B, what usually happens is you'll have one part that is the purchasing unit. So you have someone who works with sales, do a great job, and you sign a bunch of contracts, you do the integration, but maybe that people who are actually going to work on it you know, if you work in accounting or whomever's going to use your platform, they never start using the platform. And at one point, someone's going to realize it at purchasing and say, why do we keep paying this company a bunch of money? So you need to start maybe checking like how many of our users are activated, how many people are actually using this, because that's a common problem B2B that you focus on selling to the purchasing unit or the or purchasing manager. So pick whoever, whichever um, uh, metric were, are most important for you. Don't worry if that's properly according to the pirate metrics or not. Again, if you start looking at like, this is our funnel, this is what's important in our steps, you can take whichever KPIs matter to you. LTV might be totally irrelevant if you're B2B and CAC as well. Maybe you just want to see like, what's the chart? Now, once you start working more in depth with this and you have more users, you could actually use predictive data modeling. You can get quite advanced. You can start to say like, okay, uh, from start, what's the survival curves per bucket, per cohort, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what's the LTV, how does it affect them, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can train these uh, data models. Now, this is a case, I was at a company where they had, they did both hardware and software. They would have 30% downloaded and started their app. So basically people would buy their physical product, loved it, but no one would download and start their apps. And, and people are like, as long as we sell the physical products, everything is great, right? Well, it turns out, and you obviously, you know, you want these people to be your uh, ambassadors. So when I did my assessment, I, I looked at everything from vision, product strategy, how they work with discovery, how they work with development and follow-up. When it came to organization, and again, we said, we talked about the funnel, right? If people don't collaborate, it's just going to fall through. This is how they were organized. PMs were one group and tech were another. And tech had pools of developers, depending on competence skill. The requests would go left and right. It was total chaos. 
and it would rather be like, hey, buddy, you know, I like you. Could you do my feature first? Or could you just change this, please? What happened was that the product kept crashing all the time. The app, I mean, like, and this is the best review I've ever read. Someone said, it's a worthless piece of shit. My friends or neighbors would be forever disappointed. Just look at the app store reviews. I regret that I purchased and I blanked out the name. I will do everything I can to defame and not recommend it. If, if you want to grow, your users are your best ambassadors. If, if I were to sell avocados and someone walks around and says, these are the shittiest, most worthless, I hate them, I hate them. You know, that's not going to be good for my business, right? Especially if I work so hard, I work nights to be like carrying all the avocados, et cetera, et cetera. This is another case where stability was hurting revenue. Something as simple as that part, because you would have chaos in your tech department. So here we would measure that temporal network issues would have a significant drop in response codes. People didn't think about it and said, yeah, but that's not a thing, right? But we kind of realized that it, revenue had a clear correlation with stability. We worked incredibly hard to get up revenue, to do campaigns, and then they would start to drop as soon as we had issues with networking. And, and they wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't see a big spike, only with campaigns you would see a big spike because users didn't want to come back. If you cheat your users too many times, you're not going to come back. After the third avocado, I'm not going to buy avocados from you anymore. That's just how it is. So I thought, how I have an example as well, how practically you can do with the funnels and things, but tell me, how does it work for you? Is it like, well, this has nothing to do with me or like, does this relate to you guys in any kind of way? Stop my share. All right. You know what I can do in the meanwhile, if we have no questions, I can show you a very quick example of how you could do this. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be as advanced. It's just looking at the customer journey saying, okay, how do our evangelist users behave? And then you start saying like, okay, what are the steps in the customer journey that we look at which team owns that step. And then we can start to say like, what are the actions that we want the users to do? Are they happy? Is it, I mean, is, it, is the experience good today? What are the business needs? What are the KPIs? How do we want to measure our users? I mean, is it CTR to payment option? Uh, is it uh, overall CTR uh, TR to visitor, et cetera, et cetera. You might want to measure conversion rate to trial list and so forth and so forth. But basically you just wanna do it quite easily, say whose responsibility is it? When are the user happy? What do they need? Because you'll start moving away from just doing these features and, and just doing projects to actually trying to solve things, actually trying to provide value to your users and working with your colleagues, looking at it holistically, like looking at it from start to finish, you start to actually work with your colleagues. You start to say, uh, you know what? The, some don't actually know how to proceed from here. Some are really pissed off because they get stuck all the time. So this team maybe need to work closer to this team. And that's how you start that dialogue. I think my time is up within a minute. I think that someone is correct. There was some comment in the chat that, yeah, uh, someone that has issue with the mic uh, reminds them uh, so much about their previous work in startup. <laughs> I guess my, several people can can uh, uh, relate to that. Uh, uh, as you mentioned here, as soon as it's siloed in different domains and you don't see the whole, then of course things can go 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 wrong. Cool name, by the way. Junior de la Bernadina. No, and you're you're absolutely right. 
I mean, it's both applicable to large companies as as startups, but it can just get really chaotic. And you're like, it's okay, it's okay. And you have all this energy, but you're like, in reality, you're burning your own bridge while you're standing on it because your users are really pissed off. And in the beginning, you have such few users, so you want to treat them very gently, not be like, it's okay, we're going to get new ones. Because the way you get new ones is by the few you have to like you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Yasi. Yeah, we, we can pause now. We, we stop the recording. Uh, we have 10 minutes until the next session, so you're welcome to stay and chat with, with Yasi. At some point, uh, the next speaker will, will pop up. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining, and thanks, Yasi, again for your presentation. Thanks, everybody. So you have time to move session. Also, you can stay here and you can chat with Yasu. Just go ahead. I'm still here. And I mean, I get it. It's the it's it's at 4 p.m. Central European time. So I guess a lot of people are tired. They have to go pick up kids, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Life happens. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But that's it. Just yes, I was thinking that you have some uh, uh, go-to, um, you know, uh, materials to 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 read more about that. Perhaps a blog post you could share around these things. Yeah, I'm actually setting up a course around it, and I will be start sharing my blog post around it as well. Um, it can be quite difficult to apply. I mean, like if you think too advanced. You'll be like, oh, I can't do predictive data modeling. We don't have that many users, et cetera. I think the simplest thing you can do in just five minutes is take a whiteboard and say, what's the steps in the customer journey? Maybe not every click, but like it's important that they start the app, that they, you know, save a recipe, stuff like that, and then start discussing, do they actually do this? Do these two teams work together? Uh, does this happen? How can we get more people to share and follow up on that they actually mm -hmm. do? Hey, Matthias. A very, a very stupid dog, question. Dog, dog, dog. Oh, yeah, I, I got uh, uh, interesting when you say several people need, need to, uh, it's silos, you need to bring them together. Yeah. How do you do that? Do you just uh, uh, call everyone to join or do you have, you know, just, special way to set up this type of workshop? Yeah, I mean, number one, you could, you know, you could go to the CPO and be like, okay, we need to structure this. But in reality, just to make it happen, go to your colleague, say, hey, can we take 10, 15 minutes and be like, what happens here? What, what happens from my step to your step? Do we That's even, simple. yeah, just keep it very simple. Very, very simple, because that's how you get things started. Once you're going to do these advanced things, big workshops, that's like such a big threshold where in reality, you have the, if it's an app, you've all used the app, you have it on your phone and you have a whiteboard to say, okay, from my step to your step, what's going on? Great. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, everybody.